Hello, glad you could join us today for our Bible study time, and I hope you have your Bible there close at hand as we'll be looking at uh, Matthew chapter 13, where Jesus is uh, using parables to teach about the kingdom of God, and uh, uh, we're looking at three parts of this passage out of Matthew chapter 13 today. Uh, word of the kingdom of heaven will be sown on different kinds of soil is the first part of Matthew chapter 13 verses 1 through 9 and then part 2 of our lesson today is growth of the kingdom of heaven will permeate the world uh, Matthew 13 verses 31 through 33 and then the third part of our lesson for today is the worth of the kingdom of heaven will compel the forsaking of all. Compel the forsaking of all. And that is in Matthew chapter 13, verses 44 through 46. So uh, as we begin, let's pause for a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the way you bless our lives. Lord, thank you for your word itself. Uh, and Lord, for these teachings of our Savior, uh, as Jesus was teaching his disciples, as well as those who uh, drew alongside to hear what Jesus had to say about uh, the coming kingdom. So I pray that you would uh, speak to our hearts in these moments, Lord, teach us. Uh, may your Holy Spirit show us how to apply these things to our hearts and lives and how to share them with others as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, so uh, we're looking at, at parables of Jesus. Now, the word parable uh, means literally to cast alongside. Now, when I was uh, in college at Union, uh, I was uh, taught that uh, one explanation of what a parable is is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And uh, certainly that would describe what Jesus is doing uh, in this passage. Uh, the, the idea that uh, Jesus would describe the kingdom in language that would obscure uh, the understanding to some who were listening, that may sound rather strange to us, but you have to bear in mind that Jesus is talking to his disciples here. That is his primary audience. And uh, he is going to make it clear to the disciples what he's doing and what he is saying in each of these parables. Even when they didn't understand it initially, then uh, they would they would draw him aside and they would say, uh, Master, uh, teach us the, the meaning of this particular story that, uh, that you have just told. And certainly this is what he's going to do in each of these cases. He wants to make sure that the that the disciples clearly understand what the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, uh, is all about. But for those who might just be gathered around with the disciples, they just want to hear what Jesus has to say, uh, the message would not be necessarily clear to them. Uh, he did not want anything to distract him from the fact that he is going to the cross. We talked about this last week, that he is on his way to the cross, and uh, he does not want any kind of distraction to keep him on that path. He wants to make sure that his disciples know and understand exactly what the kingdom of heaven is all about, and, and the kind of responsibility uh, that he is giving to them after he has ascended, gone back to his father, they are the, going to be the ones that uh, he is going to be depending on for uh, carrying further the message of the kingdom of heaven and what it means and how a person can be a part of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. Can Those two terms can be used interchangeably here. Uh, so, uh, have you ever been in a group where uh, everybody else understood exactly uh, what the object lesson was, uh, except for you? You know, everybody else seems to be either laughing or saying, yeah, that's right, that's right, but you're not getting it, you're not understanding it well. Uh, there probably were some people who were doing 
that same thing in that day. But once again, Jesus is going to make it clear to his disciples exactly what he's doing. And, and the only one out of the 12 at this point who would not really get the message would be Judas, the one who would eventually betray him because his heart was not set on the kingdom of heaven. His heart was set on Jesus establishing a kingdom on earth right now. So uh, he would reject what Jesus was, was trying to do and, uh, and, and really would not grasp the message. He rejected the idea uh, of a heavenly kingdom, of a godly kingdom in favor of a kingdom here on earth where Jesus would be king and they would be uh, co-regents with him. They would be rulers also uh, under his authority, okay, but, but that they would be rulers too. So uh, here we go. Let's look at Matthew chapter 13, beginning with verse 1, and we'll read through verse 9. And this is uh, usually called the parable of the sower. On that day, Jesus went out of the house and was sitting by the sea. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat down while the whole crowd stood on the shore. Now, this was a customary method in that day and time for uh, teachers, for those who were giving instruction in God's word, uh, was that they would be seated and usually the audience would be standing. Well, that's what they would be doing here. If Jesus is sitting out in a boat, uh, and uh, just at the edge of the water, but enough to be have a little distance between him and the people who wanted to get as close to him, who wanted to touch him. So he's out in the water just a little way, but the people can still hear him very well, and he's teaching. So uh, this is a very common uh, kind of setting that he's in here. Verse 3, Then he told them many things in parables, saying, Consider the sower who went out to sow. Now, uh, remember again, that uh, Jesus is, is telling parables, uh, he's telling stories. Uh, how often have you remembered a sermon from the illustration that was given? You may not have remembered what the text was or, or what the theme of the message was, but you remembered the story, you remembered the illustration that the teacher or pastor uh, used. Well, and that's exactly what Jesus is doing here. What a powerful and effective way. And he is using stories in the, in the case of the sower here. Uh, they lived in, a, in an agrarian culture, an agrarian society, farming culture, uh, raising stock, raising sheep, uh, those kinds of things. So uh, they would relate extremely well to the stories that Jesus is going to tell uh, and in his use of parables here, uh, saying, verse 3, Consider the sower who went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and ate them up. Others fell on rocky ground where there wasn't much soil, and they sprang up quickly since the soil wasn't deep. But when the sun came up, they were scorched, and since they had no root, they withered. Others fell among thorns, and the thorns came up and choked them. Still others fell on good ground and produced a crop, some 100, some 60, some 30 times what was sown. Anyone who has ears should hear or should listen and, and pay attention. So let's, let's work this out now. Let's walk through this. Uh, a, a seasoned farmer in that day and time uh, would have taken actions to prepare the soil uh, for the very best result. But that's not necessarily what Jesus is talking about. Jesus is not talking about farming here. He's talking about uh, sharing the gospel, distributing the good news to those, anyone who would hear uh, the good news of the kingdom of God. The sower in this parable uh, is one who is scattering the seed. Now, was that Jesus? It could be, but uh, most probably here, he was talking about any and all who would uh, share the good news of the kingdom of God, share the good news of heaven, and, and what was necessary for one to uh, be a part of the kingdom of heaven. So he says that in, in this case, the farmer is sowing his seed. He's just scattering them everywhere. 
Uh, you may have done that. I do that occasionally when I want to oversee my yard. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll take a, a bag of seeds. Sometimes I've got a little hand sore that I can uh, turn the handle and it scatters seed. Uh, in something of a pattern, but uh, a lot of times I'll just I'll just broadcast the seed. I grew up on a farm. I saw my dad do this a lot of times. He'd just go with a a bag of seed, or sometimes he had a, a, a sower uh, that he a manual sower that he put over his shoulder and it had a little crank on it, and he'd crank that thing, and it would scatter seed 15 or 20 feet away from him, and he'd walk up and down, up and down, back and forth uh, across the field, sowing that field with uh, wheat or whatever. Uh, he happened to be sowing, and I've done the same thing. So this is called a, a broadcast method uh, that the farmer would be using here. He's just scattering seed everywhere. Now, normally uh, the fields of that day and time would have pathways through them uh, that the farmer would walk on, and because he would uh, travel that path across the field uh, many times on the same path, that path would become hardened after a while. Now. Uh, the, the farmer, if he'd been really working at it, he would have gone and tried to pull out the weeds before he sowed uh, any of the good seed. Uh, but still, uh, nevertheless, there would be some weeds that would grow up in, in the farms of that day and time in, in Israel. And uh, one of the seeds that would uh, germinate, uh, you, sometimes it's, it's part of the bag of seed that he's got. They couldn't get all the seed out that were bad seed. Uh, but nevertheless, he's, he's sowing the seed uh, and, and doing so without reference to the soil here. Uh, the seed would fall on either hard ground, the hard pathways. Uh, some of the seed would fall on rocky ground. And uh, that that fell on rocky ground, uh, there, there was a, a, a thin layer of soil in many places in Israel where the farmer would be doing that. The, that thin layer may have been, uh, you know, only a couple of inches deep, and then there'd be a, a, a limestone layer under that. And uh, uh, it would take soil, take a root quickly because of the warmth of the rock layer underneath the soil, and it would spring up, but it wouldn't last long. So, and then the, there would be some thorns, there would be some darnel, there would be some uh, wild stuff that would invariably come up uh, in in the crop and then there would be some good ground there would be some area that would be uh, relatively free of the uh, thorns and wild stuff that might be growing there well the the seed would fall on these different kinds of ground and the crop Jesus says uh, could result in um, a, a return of 30 times what was sown 60 times maybe even a hundred times when you had really pure seed uh, and you had really good ground. Maybe you'd get a, a hundredfold return. And then Jesus in verses 18 through 23 explains the meaning of this parable that he has just told. He said, you then listen to the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word about the kingdom and doesn't understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Now he's talking about the devil here. Uh, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the one sown along the path. Now, the seed that fell on the path, he said it's just real easy for the devil to uh, persuade that person who doesn't have any real root anyway. The, the, his heart is hardened. Uh, the devil can easily snatch that person away who might otherwise have believed. This is the one sown along the path and the one sown on rocky ground. This is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet he has no root in himself, but is short-lived. When pressure or persecution comes because of the word, immediately he stumbles. Now the one sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word. But the worries of this age and the seduction of wealth choke the word and it becomes unfruitful. But the one sown on the good ground, this is the one who hears and understands the word, who does bear fruit and yields some 100, some 60, some 30 times uh, what was sown. So uh, you and I are not responsible as we sow the seed. We are not responsible for the condition of the heart of that person to whom we may be sharing the gospel. Uh, it, it's just up to us to share the gospel. That's our job. The condition of the hearts of men, that's, that's for God to deal with. That, that's for God to worry about. Uh, 
so uh, uh, you know that that may be hard for us to understand, but it's absolutely true. Uh, a, a pastor here in the Jackson area shared a testimony just recently. In fact, just this past Monday, I heard him tell this. He was a bivocational pastor most of his ministry, and in his early days uh, of pastoring, preaching. Uh, he was also working at a job down in Louisiana, uh, way on down in the Homa area, uh, south of New Orleans. And uh, he said he, had, he knew that God had called him to ministry, but he had to have a job. He had to be able to make a job, make a living, take care of his family. So he was down there working, and uh, he was praying. He said, God, send, get, send me a church while I'm here. Send me a place where I could minister to others. Send me a place where where I can tell the good news of Jesus. And uh, a pastor friend in the area uh, said, I know you want to preach. And he said, let me show you where there's a church that needs a pastor. So he showed him this small church, and uh, he said it, it only had maybe 10 people or so who were attending. And the, the building had not had any attention in a long time. It was really in bad shape. So uh, he prayed about it, and he said, Lord, that's not what I expected. I, I thought, thought you'd give me a church that would be uh, already up and running. There would you know, things would be in good shape, and I could just go in and preach. But he said, Lord, nevertheless, whatever you give me to do, I'm glad to do. Well, uh, he took that little handful of people. They agreed for him to come and be their pastor. And um, uh, so uh, uh, they began to fix up the building, make some repairs, absolutely necessary repairs if you're going to have people to come in there. And uh, then he began to call the people together and preach. And, and uh, he said, I, I didn't have time to go out and, and visit in all the homes of the people in the area. He said there were a few visits that I was able to make. But he said, primarily, I was just preaching on Sunday and preaching the Word of God as best I knew, best I understood how to do that. And he said people began to come. Long story short, in three years' time, he said he baptized 76 people out of that little community. And he said, I, I recognize, he said, it wasn't me. It wasn't me. It was, it was God simply allowing the seed that I was trying to sow to fall on ground where God would give the increase. God would provide for preparing the hearts of the people to hear the gospel. Uh, and so uh, this is just a simple illustration to show that, that we're not responsible for preparing the soil on which we share the good news of the gospel. We're re responsible for sharing the good news of the gospel. That's our job. The rest of it is, is God's job. It's always God who gives the growth. It's always God who gives the growth. If you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and uh, verse 7, you see, um, you see what Paul has to say about this. Uh, you know, Corinth was not an easy place to pastor, and uh, they, <laughs> they got in arguments with each other quite often, and, and uh, they, they were already splitting in divisions. Uh, some were saying, hey, I, I belong to Apollos. Uh, some others say, man, Paul is, Paul is my man, and, and uh, uh, others maybe somebody else. And so Paul uh, rebukes them about this. He said, hey, folks, uh, he said, what is Apollos and what is Paul? They are servants through whom you believed, and each has the role the Lord has given. I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. God gave the increase. That's his business. Ours is just simply to share the good news of Christ with others. Now, once a person trusts Christ as Savior, certainly we want to help them to be able to grow. But he says as far as coming to trust Christ as Savior and, and uh, really uh, begin to grow, he said then certainly we want to help them to be able to grow. But that initial response to the gospel, that initial response to an invitation to be a part of the kingdom of God. That's God's business. So uh, just, just want to be real clear about that. We ought not to ever be discouraged uh, in our church uh, if we don't see great growth occurring, if we don't see people just come flocking down the aisle every Sunday to be saved. We ought not to get discouraged. What we ought to do is be sharing the good news of Christ. Now, the second part of of this lesson is growth of the kingdom of heaven will permeate the world. 
Uh, and this again is in Matthew 13, and we're looking at verses 31 through 33. 31 through 33. He presented another parable to them. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed that a man took and sowed in his field. It's the smallest of all the seeds, but when grown, it's taller than the vegetables and becomes a tree so that the birds of the sky come and nest in its branches. He told them another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into 50 pounds of flour until it spread through all of it. Now, Jesus is, is telling the disciples this primarily again. He's telling them this because he doesn't want them to be upset uh, and, and discouraged if, if the kingdom does not just grow rapidly, uh, if they're not great crowds, great throngs that come to, come to hear what they have to share. Because he said the, the kingdom of heaven is going to grow slowly. It's going to grow slowly. But the end result will be multiplied millions and millions and millions of people uh, in the world who are going to come to know Christ as Savior. As people ask me sometimes, why do you think, why do you think Jesus is tarrying? Uh, Peter answered this question. You know, there were people saying, "Well, you know, maybe Jesus has already come, and, and, and we did, we got left behind. Maybe, maybe, uh, maybe God didn't want us in heaven. Uh, you know, just crazy things like that." Uh, but uh, the truth is, uh, Jesus said, "Look, it's going to start small. It'll be like a grain of mustard seed, a tiny, tiny seed in their day and time." And it's, it's going to grow, though, as that seed is planted, as the gospel message is planted in people's hearts. And remember again, we're not responsible for the condition of the heart of the person who receives the seed. We're responsible for sowing the seed. So he said, from, from that tiny seed that is planted in men's hearts, those who, who are believers, those who become a part of the kingdom, they're going to tell somebody else, and that person's going to tell somebody else, and that person's going to tell somebody else, and they're going to keep on doing that until one day, uh, one day, when Jesus comes again, uh, he's going to find a great harvest, a great harvest of believers. Not all, not all when he comes back will be believers, certainly not. The Bible warns us about uh, any idea that he's going to just throw open the doors of heaven and say, all right, everybody, come on in. No, only those who have trusted him, only those who have believed are going to be invited to the banquet, to the, to the meal with our Savior. So Jesus tells a parable here of the mustard seed and the, and the leaven uh, in, in the uh, flour, the leaven that uh, is a small piece of leaven, a small piece of, of yeast bread is mixed in with 50 pounds of flour and it's stirred and stirred and stirred until eventually all of it is leavened. All the flour is leavened and will produce bread that will rise. He said that's the way the kingdom of heaven is going to grow. And remember again, we're talking about uh, we're talking about um, uh, sharing Christ with others. It's going to start from a tiny small seed and then it's going to grow and grow and grow. Uh, whether you are a Tom Brady fan or not, now for those of you that are not football fanatics, Tom Brady was the quarterback for the New England Patriots for years and years and years and won uh, six Super Bowl championships and, and then they eventually retired him when he got to be about 42 years old. They said, man, you know, we need a young guy now that can do this job. So he said, I'm not ready to retire whether you retire me or not. I'm going to keep on working. So he goes down to Tampa and goes to work with them as their quarterback. Well, uh, in 2000, when Tom Brady was drafted uh, by the New England Patriots, he was a young guy. And he was drafted as number 199 in that draft. <laughs> That's way down the line. He certainly was not the number one pick in the draft in 2000. But over the years, he kept training. He kept training. He kept doing uh, what he knew to do. And from that small, small beginning as number 99 pick, uh, eventually came 
to uh, be the leader of that team to win six Super Bowl championships. So uh, that's just one, one little illustration for those of you who are football fans to show how from small beginnings great things are coming. And that's what Jesus is saying about sowing the seed and, and putting the yeast in the flour that it would grow and grow and grow. Uh, the kingdom of God is going to grow over time through uh, remarkably, remarkably modest means. Um, not everybody is going to be a Billy Graham. Not every preacher is going to be a Billy Graham. They might wish they could be. But uh, he said the, the, the gospel, when it's sown, is going to reap results beyond anything you can imagine. Then uh, the, the third part of this lesson is uh, the worth of the kingdom of heaven will compel the forsaking of all. And this is shown in Matthew 13, 44 uh, through 46. 44 through 46. The kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy, he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. Okay. Uh, Jesus uses two short parables here to illustrate the value of the kingdom of heaven. Uh, some people are compulsive shoppers today. There was a survey taken not too long ago that showed that 6% that of adult women are compulsive shoppers. Interestingly enough, 5.5% of men are also compulsive shoppers. They see this, oh, I just got to have that. Oh, I, oh, yeah, more, 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 more. Well, the more, more, more that we have of this world makes it harder and harder and harder for us to be invested in the kingdom of heaven, in the kingdom of God. So as, as Christian people, as those who are a part of the kingdom of heaven already, who love the Lord, who have trusted Christ as Savior, for, for those of us in that category, we need to be careful about our passion to want more of this world and not so much of the kingdom of heaven. If you go back and you read the teachings of Jesus, you read the Sermon on the Mount, he gives a prescription there for what is expected of the Christian what the Christian life is supposed to look like. You go back and read Matthew 6, 7, and 8, and, and you read what he describes for us as a person who would not just be a believer. There are a lot of people in this world who are just believers. And they say, oh, yeah, I trusted Christ as my Savior. Well, uh, uh, t tell me some of the things that, that you're doing with your life. Uh, in other words, to put it in biblical language, show me some fruit. Show me some fruit. Well, unfortunately, there are a lot of people who don't have much fruit to tell you about. They don't have much of a demonstration of fruit in their life. So what Jesus is trying to uh, show us here is that the kingdom of heaven and having Jesus Christ and his Holy Spirit active in our lives as yeast and as uh, uh, that which will multiply uh, in us, grow from small beginnings into great things out of the sharing of the good news uh, of Jesus Christ, not for, not for our glory, not for our benefit, but for his honor and glory. He says the only way for us to to fulfill in us or for God to fulfill in us what he really intends is for us to turn loose more and more and more to loosen our grip upon the things of this world and to intently intensely seek after the things that will grow his kingdom and that will grow what he intended for this world to become. And that is an example of what his kingdom would be if we would follow him. How can Christians live to demonstrate, demonstrate that the kingdom of heaven 
is their greatest treasure. Well, he told two simple stories here. The man who found a great treasure in the field and sold everything that he had so he could buy that field. He went out and hid the treasure in that field, and then he went and bought the field so he could have the treasure. And then the man who found the pearl of great price gave up everything that he had so that he could purchase that pearl of great price. It's just a simple illustration to show the value, the real value in life, in our life, is uh, as a Christian, as a believer, is to fully invest all that we are and all that we have into serving the Lord Jesus and into completing the task that he has given us today. Oh, I hope that God's blessing your life. I hope that you're enjoying serving him, that you're enjoying all the things that he's given us. Oh, my goodness. He blesses us more. He blesses Judy and me more every day. We pray in our prayer time every day. I, I, I give thanks to God for the way he blesses us. And I pray, Lord, help me in return to allow what you've invested in me. You've put that greatest of all possessions, and that is the, the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and, and, the, and, and the privilege of sharing his word. It's the power of his word that uh, brings people to Christ. It's not who I am or who you are or anything else. It is the power of God working through his word and working through uh, what we're willing to give to him that we might honor him and that we might see people come to Christ as Savior. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you again so much for reminding us of the responsibility that we have as believers, as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, that from very small things, uh, few in number as they were when Jesus was still here with his disciples, the kingdom of heaven was just being, uh, just beginning at that point with these disciples, and uh, that as they shared the good news of Jesus Christ, that that kingdom would grow as people came to know Christ as their Savior and Lord. Help us to, to have that in our hearts, that passion to let others know of the love that Christ has for us to the point that he was willing to die on the cross, that we might have forgiveness of our sins and the gift of eternal life so that we can share that gift with others. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.